Hey guys, how you doing? This is uh, Mike McCormick with Advanced Criminology in Owings Mills, Maryland. Uh, tonight we're going to cover a topic uh, that's entitled uh, Four Weeks Since the Death of Detective Sean Souter. Um, now it's been four weeks since the death of the detective and um, those of you who are new to the channel, we're discussing the death of a young officer who was uh, murdered with his own handgun in the uh, west part of Baltimore City uh, four weeks ago. And uh, what we've decided to do tonight was basically take a look at um, what, where, where, where is the police department at this point in the investigation some four weeks later. Um, so right now there's a questionable suspect, as we all know, with a black jacket and a, and a white stripe uh, and a black male, of course. Uh, there's no arrest at this particular time. Um, the FBI seems to be on the fence. Uh, it's been probably a week, going on 10 days now, where the police commissioner of Baltimore City has asked and requested, along with the mayor, um, and that uh, the FBI come in and, 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 and get involved in this case. Um, in addition, uh, the BPD homicide department basically has come to a stall, uh, for the most part. So. Uh, my question was, why is it taking the FBI so long to make a decision? Um, those of you who have been following news, you know that attorney Jeff Sessions was in town yesterday. Um, that would have been on the 12th of uh, December. And uh, the question was asked by the news media as to when would the FBI be, would be stepping in. And the, com and, and the attorney general really didn't have a concrete answer other than you know, we're going to be looking at it, and he just didn't give a time frame as to when. This is very troublesome to me, simply because um, if you follow homicide investigations, we all know that the quicker that you can get in to do your forensic work, the quicker you can talk to witnesses when their minds are, are, are fresh with, with uh, um, things that they might have seen or heard, uh, the better it is for your case. Right now, this is strictly a cold case at this point, and um, with the FBI... Uh, taking their time to make an effort to, to come this way is, is, is troublesome. Um, one of the things that I thought about uh, is that since uh, we were down, since we were last uh, at the uh, homicide location, um, that particular scene has been cleaned up now. I mean, everything is cleaned up. Uh, the lot is, is, is flat. It's perfect looking. You wouldn't, the, the videos that we shot three or four weeks ago, the, the particular areas now, areas um, A and B, uh, don't even look like they did. So um, my question would be that if the FBI is coming in to do a forensic investigation, well, the scene has pretty much been compromised, in my estimation, at this point. Uh, the other thing is, what is it? If the FBI has information, what, what is that information? If it's not going to be related to any crime scene information because they haven't been there to process the scene, uh, the police department already did that, um, then what information would they bring to bear in this particular case? And so it's, it's troubling to me, but what I want to do is kind of recap what we already know, so to speak, and um, talk about some other things regarding the case. Um, take my glasses off. So what we know in this particular case is that there were two rounds, three rounds fired, uh, one fired into the officer's head, the other two, we still don't know where they are. Um, we still don't know whether or not the crime lab ever looked for those two rounds. Uh, other than looking in the ground, there was four or five different other places where those rounds could have been uh, aimed at and shot. And so we've never recovered those two rounds. So that's very, that's very interesting on, on, on my part to th think about, you know, why didn't the police department continue to pursue the other two rounds? Um, I mean, they had the place locked down for several days, so you would think that they would have would have done that. So that that's a question that came up. Um, we're still looking for someone with a black jacket and a white stripe. Um, we know from the testimony of uh, the crime scene folks that the officer's clothing was in disarray, as if he had been in a fight. Um, we know that there was a scuffle based upon what was at the crime scene. Uh, in terms of uh, footprints and scuffle prints and probably dirt on the officer's shoes. Um, we know that the uh, 
Suda, uh, so, De Detective Suda uh, died. He had his radio clutched in his in his left hand. We know that because when backup officers arrived, we were able to. Well, we weren't able to see, but the, but the 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 report has been that the um, body cameras that the backup officers were wearing when they finally got to to back up uh, the officers on the scene, they uh, the body cameras actually showed that. Um, we let's see. We also know that there was a call for distress, a short burst call on the on the officer's radio uh, that was sent over to the FBI for analysis, and the FBI came back shortly thereafter that they could not make out what was going on. They did hear the shot. It did sound like there was the officer was in distress when the call was made for, for assistance. So that we know to be true. Um, let's see what else. But one one thing I, I thought I, I, is I'll go back to the radio transmission. There was a second transmission that's been reported by some news outlets uh, that came from the uh, police departments, what they call KGA service. And um, one of the things that this particular dispatcher said, what we don't have is we don't have the call that came into dispatch, which is very important. We still don't have that information. The police department does not give us that call that was made by the partner on the cell phone into the, the uh, 911 service. So, but we do have what the 911 service said. And they said, and I quote you, they said, we do not know where the shots came from. We have officers in a bad location. Let's everybody take cover somewhere. I'll give it to you again. We do not know where the shots came from. We have officers in a bad location. Let's everybody take cover somewhere. If you go back at a couple of videos when I was telling you uh, when officers arrive on the scene of a crime, whether it's a dispatch call, whether it's a call that's on view, something they've actually, a crime that they're about to investigate, uh, they're supposed to give their location so that in the event something happens, as in this case something happened, um, if you can't get on your radio and if you you have a garbled transmission at least the dispatch knows when you key that particular microphone um, pretty much um, who you are and where you are and then they'll call they'll call units because now they're saying well this particular unit was last they last gave us a location here now sometimes uh, when I was on the police department and you had what they call a signal 13 where officers in distress um, Particularly when the you can't raise the officer. That's what they call it when they want to talk to you. If, if the dispatch wants to talk to you, talk to you. They're trying to raise you on the on the uh, uh, walkie talking. Um, what they do then is what they call a roll call. So if I'm in a unit, let's say I'm in a in in a sector. Um, I worked in sector three in central district back in the day, um, and there were five five posts in that particular sector. So I was 132 car. So you have 131, 132, 33, 34, and 35. So that would cover those those five posts in that sector. So let's just say that, for instance, I, I got into trouble and I gave a distress out for signal 13. Well, once I couldn't give my location again on that radio, the dispatch will do what they call a quick roll call. So he'll they'll go down and say, oh, uh, 131, come in, and 131 say, you know, I'm here, 132, you know, I mean, 133, 134, 35, and they'll answer up then they'll know that if I don't answer up, it's me who has the problem. I, it's me who's in distress. We don't know whether any of that is done because we don't have any other conversations after what I just told you. So let's break that down and let's see what it's in, what's, what's, what's behind this particular call from KGA out into the field of officers. Um, we do not know where the shots came from, which means that when the backup officer called in, he told that dispatcher, I don't know where the shots are coming from. Dispatcher replied, we don't know where the shots came from. Makes sense. The next thing is that we have officers in a bad location. He apparently couldn't give his location for whatever reason. Didn't understand. He couldn't make out where he was for whatever reason. I, I can't answer that for that officer. So it says here we have officers in a bad location. So that means there was 
whatever he said to dispatch, they still couldn't understand him. The next thing dispatch says is that let's everybody take cover somewhere. Simply dispatch is saying that because they don't really know what the heck is going on out in the field with these particular with this particular transmission and this officer. So for officer safety's sake, the dispatch came back on the air and said, hey, everybody who's re, uh, in the area responding wherever, just take cover for, for the sake of taking cover. Where? Somewhere. So this, this whole thing is really something that just gets out of hand from the very beginning. Um, it's not what I would say the following departmental policy at all. Um, it just, it, 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 this thing unfolded so bad for Officer Suda after he was shot, it's unbelievable. So I'll just leave that as it, as it is. But I wanted to discuss that because, you know, that, it, the, the, that you got to look behind the words of what people are saying to get, you know, a true meaning and a full meaning. Um, now, one of the other things that I wanted to discuss is that, let me go back to the FBI just for a second. Now, if the FBI didn't do, is not going to do, which we don't know, but I assume since the forensics has already been done, um, why would they come back to do a second forensics? Maybe they have better equipment to, you know, analyze the, the area, um, whatever they're going to do. Um, but they certainly wouldn't take, once you've been invited to come in, why take so long to come in knowing that a crime scene has already been compromised? Because the, com the crime scene was turned over to the public three, four weeks ago, three weeks ago. So it's been trampled over, it's been cleaned up. So whatever evidence might be there is probably gone. So in my mind, if they're not coming in to do forensics, then they must have intelligence uh, where that intelligence is leading in the direction of more than one officer involved in the circumstances surrounding Officer Suda's death. Because it, 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 I'm trying to make the connection here with the FBI. The FBI is on, 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 on top of their game. Um, so in my mind, it's just me, I'm thinking that the FBI has a lot of information in this particular case and they're building their case right now and they may not need to come in to do any forensics in that particular area at all. They may have enough information Right, and a suspect or suspects in this case, and they're still putting it together. Remember, when the FBI does investigations, they take their time. Um, they line their ducks up in a row so that when they come after you, they pretty much already have everything they need to uh, make an arrest and probably get a good conviction. That's how they operate. They don't rush things at all over in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's not what they do. So I just thought I'd bring that up because here we are four weeks into this thing, <clears throat> into this thing, <coughs> excuse me, and um, we had no suspect, no arrest. Um, the homicide unit is stalled at, at BPD, and we're still waiting on word about uh, whether or not the FBI is going to come in and take over the case. Now, the, the mayor has already indicated she has spoken with the detective's wife. The detective's wife, certainly, I know she's distraught over this whole thing. And again, she's getting all types of information coming from dis different sources herself. So I'm sure she's having her doubts as well as to how her husband was murdered. One minute she's talking to him before he goes to work that morning. The next minute she's getting a phone call from I was getting the police department from, they lived in York, Pennsylvania, they, so they got police coming up there from York, Pennsylvania and the city police department to, to notify her that her husband is in the hospital fighting for his life because he just got shot in the head. So, you know, she's trying to understand the whole process of what the hell happened. Not only is she, there are millions of other people out here too trying to find out what the hell happened. Um, so, the things that I outlined and itemized to you was kind of the physical evidence of the things that we already know. See, we already know all this stuff. What we're waiting on is something new. Tell us something new so we can connect the old to the new, right? And then we can kind of come to a conclusion as to what happened. But right now we don't have any new stuff. We're still fighting with the old stuff. So 
uh, you know, that's where I'm at uh, with this whole incident. And um, I'd like to hear your comments on this. Uh, if you would, appreciate it. I'll get right back to you as always. Um, so I'll keep it short. Again, my name is Mike McCormick with Advanced Criminology here in Owings Mills. Uh, keep subscribing. We need subscribers. So if you hear this and you, you, you like the quality of what we're putting out, then feel free to subscribe for us. Share the videos as well. And I'll see you next time we post. Thank you.